As you see in the building, we back. We rocking and we rolling like Chuck Berry. <laughs> you feel me? You know what I'm saying? Sorry for the late show. Really wanted to do this a little bit earlier. Wanted to do it Sunday, but hey, things happen. Um, debate business happened Sunday and today. Work kicked my you-know-what. <laughs> And uh, did a 13-hour day. So we're here, though. We're here. We're here. We're going to open up with the Band 2 expansion. We're going to talk about it. We got we got something we need to talk about. You know what I'm saying? We say no to vague interpretations and give that old breakdown. Y'all know what's going to happen, man. Click that like button. You know what I'm saying? Subscribe to the Source Debate League on YouTube. And I just want to take this time out to appreciate all all of our supporters, our subscribers, and our viewers. You understand? Much love to the family that makes this thing work. Because without y'all, without an audience, we're nothing. So we appreciate you guys. Um, with no further ado, let's get into the introduction. Shout out to the CEO. Just stepped in. Hey, hey guys, shoot, before you get started, man, I just wanted to let you know, man, uh, the the, the family's been waiting on this presentation, bro. I just want to try to catch you before you got started, man, and uh, let everybody know, man, get your pads, your pencils, man, fact check some of this information, go verify some of this information, look into it yourself. There's a multitude of gang sayers when it comes to a lot of information, so you yourself personally have to be prepared. So this information is for you to be elevated, man, so Man, look, man, the source supports you, brother. We in for it. We, we, we in the audience, man. We, we, we rooting you on, brother. Yeah, yeah, bro. Just make sure I don't have no technical mishaps, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, I can't see the stream when I'm in the presentation, my presentation, you know. Yeah. Just let me know. All right? So, um, yeah. yeah, man, we're going to hit the intro. Cue the intro and, and get started. Who's coming with me? This is your side, the source now. Taking over the game, put it on landline. We're the better roster, sickness of way the lobster. Let the figures hate for revenge will never stop us. This is your side, the source now. Taking over the game, put it on landline. We're the better roster, sickness of way the lobster. Let the figures hate for revenge will never stop us. Kill the cancer, you can call me a sick assassin. Cut the chains, you can call me LeBron James. Make a decision, but you never had the intuition. Changing the vision, but more them that cause the vision. Never in submission like I need permission. Nigga steady telling lies like a politician. Nigga need to cool it down, but we the new addition. Yes. Yeah, the name is the source, check the reinvention. You think we not prepared for the fallout? Watch us stack this information. Watch us. Towards the Bay League in the building, the SUC in the building. Y'all know how we get down, man. Y'all already know what we do, man. We put in that work. Everybody else, these other groups, they naysayers, man. Where they works at? You should know a tree by its fruits. And y'all fruits ain't there, man. If we had to depend on y'all, we'd be starving. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to open this up with Ciroc 44 because I'm going to stand on what I'm about to say forever. I feel like the Israelites have done the best at doing this. And when I say doing what? Honoring our ancestors, man. Y'all haven't honored our ancestors. You Afrocentrics ain't honored our ancestors. You know what I'm saying? You have relegated your ancestors to a color, man. You have relegated your ancestors to a, to a term that was made in post-colonial times. Dictated by the people that you claim you hate. You claim that you don't want nothing to do with it, right? African, African-American, you proud to be African and all that other stuff. You ain't honoring your ancestors. We honoring our ancestors by giving glory to their names and what, what they called themselves, one, and secondly, to their history. And we're going to let it be known, man. You see what I'm saying? And that's why I take this so serious and I take genetics so serious. I'm going to put respect on Haplo Group E until somebody put me in that grave, man. And I got a headstone above me. Till then, I'm going to wrap mine. 
And that's why I want to open up with Ciroc 44 before I got to my PowerPoint presentation. Because we've been doing this. Israelites been doing this. You know what I'm saying? You ain't you Afrocentrics ain't put the respect on our ancestors' name like that. You ain't did that. So Sirach 44 is a hymn in honor of our ancestors. You feel me? It says, let us now praise famous men. When did you Afrocentrics do that? The Israelites do it all the time. We love our history. We love our people. We love our ancestry. You put, you, 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 you sully their names when you use these terms and superimpose these terms like, oh, well, we just black. Everybody in Africa the same. In this presentation, we're going to prove everybody in Africa ain't the same. Because something happened during a period of time known by scholars at the bond to expansion. So Sirach 44 verse 1 says, let us now praise famous men in our fathers in their generations. And that's what I'm doing with this presentation. I'm giving credence to what our ancestors did in the continent of Africa and what took place, excuse me, and what took place during that time and the techno technological advancements that they accrued during that time. It says the Lord apportioned to them great glory, his majesty from the beginning. There was those who ruled in their kingdoms. And we're going to bring out that these people established kingdoms, man. Your ancestors. And where men renowned for their power, you want to see that these people were powerful and they were reputed to be powerful. Giving counsel by their understanding and proclaiming prophecies. And we understand that our people were a spiritual people and they had great understanding. That's how they were able to do all of the feats that they did, you understand, in times past. Like when you read about Hezekiah, he, he, he understood irrigation. His people understood irrigation. You understand? And it, and it helped them in the time of need when they were uh, when Israel was under persecution by the Assyrians. So these are. Great men of understanding, and we're going to look at these Bantus and see that they were great men of understanding. It said, leaders of peoples in their deliberations. These people were leaders of people. They, they understood government, societal structure. Our ancestors brought that to people that did not understand those sciences. You understand? Those people you keep trying to group us with, our ancestors brought that understanding to them. We're not A and B. We're not Bushmen. We're not Pygmies. <laughs> you see? We brought that understanding to Africa, man. Y'all going to see today. It says, in an understanding of learning for the people, wise in, in the word, in their words of instruction, those who compose musical tunes and set forth verses and writings, rich men furnished with resources. And you're going to see that the bond tools were rich men furnished with resources. And that's how they dominated and took over the continent of Africa. The way I'm about to present it, you ain't heard this like this before. We dominated and took Africa. Y'all never heard because we, we wasn't native there. We came in. We are not autochthonous Africans, meaning we do not belong there. We came in and we wrecked shop. It says, it says, um, live peacefully in their habitation. All these were honored in their generations and were the glory of their times. There are some of them who have left a name so that men declare their praise. And there are some who have no memorial, who have perished as though they have not lived. And that's what I'm here for. Those that don't have a memorial, I will speak for them. I will bring that history to you guys. I'm going to speak for those that don't have a memorial. And God damn it, they're going to have a memorial on the source. They have become as though they have not been born. And that's how y'all been treating my ancestors. You, you act as if they never existed. It's like they haven't even been born. But I am going to bring it to the recollection of their pro, uh, posterity. posterity. And so had their children after them. But these were men of mercy whose righteous deeds have not been forgotten. Their prosperity will remain 
with their descendants and their inheritance to their children's children. The, descend the descendants stand by the covenants, their children also for their sake. And we know who stands by the covenants, they Israelites. And you already know I'm, I'm going to make that connection tonight as well. Their posterity, meaning their children, right? Those that come after them, their offspring, will continue forever and their glory will not be blotted out. Their bodies were buried in peace and their names lived to all, all generations. People will declare that wisdom and the congregation proclaims that praise. Now, I know we're going to get some religious person saying, oh, that ain't talking about the Bantu. They're just talking about the Israelites. The Bantus are Israelites. <laughs> and I'm going to stand on that. And secondly, I'm using this scripture as a concept to wrap around my topic that I'm teaching today. So let's get into it. Man. Let's get right into it. Let's get right into it, man. Let's talk about Bantu archaeogenetics, the Bantu expansion. Matter of fact, Bantu expansion. And let's get into this, man. Let's take this deep dive, man. I need y'all to ride with me for an, for an hour or two. Just for an hour or two so we can get this science, this archaeology, and this genetics that we need to unravel the glory and honor of our ancestors. All right. First slide. First off, I want to deal with migratory data and why it's putative. Putative means it's just regarded as the date or the route or whatever you're talking about. It's not something that's emphatic or an actual or factual. Because a reason why I want to put this in my presentation, because you'll get a lot of people saying, well, we know the Bantus came from West Africa and that's where they originate. No, you don't. Those are all putative. Putatives are assumptions. Another word for putative is assumption. People assume they originate in West Africa. And we're going to make strong arguments from where they really, where they really from, you know what I'm saying, in our model and what we depict. All right, so migratory data is putative. They're just assumptions and presuppositions. These movements, smaller in scale, many putative in nature, likely would reflect a profusion of migra migrational events accompanied by a myriad of linguistic interactions such as separation and fusion of dialects and languages. The scientific community actively debates the putative migration routes in the dispersal timeline. So when people try to stick you with timelines and stick you with migration, oh, they came from this area, that's all assumptions. They do not know. The only way you can know 100% for sure is if you jumped in a time machine, you was able to see it as it was happening. Anything else is putative. So we build our model, model off of the data and we come to our conclusion with methodology. Then the source is ancestral DNA. For the next six or seven slides, it's going to be the same source. So bear with me, family. Genetic footprint. The genetic footprint of the uh, Bantus. Genetics clearly indicates that the observed shared characteristics are among Bantu populations are not just a result of acculturation or transfer of knowledge, but an actual movement of people at mixing with local groups and passing their genes to them. So I want that to be known that the Bantu actually spread around Africa and passed their genes around. Again, same source ancestral DNA written by the geneticist Rain J. Herrera, page number 408. Now the Bantu's footprint, according to the orthodoxy, the expansion may have been driven by overpopulation, the need for more land, famine, tribal conflicts, disease, and or climatic changes such as a drought. Yet it is not clear to what degree the movement was self-conscious as opposed to opportunistic farmers just looking for better agricultural land and in process displacing endogenous populations. So one thing I want y'all to get out of this is the fact that the Bantus were farmers. So there was a agrarian agriculturalist, right? And they displaced endogenous populations. In our model, these endogenous populations would be the Hamites. The people with A and B, Y, D, and A haplogroups and haplotypes. A number of innovations, including agriculture, new crops, bananas, jam, borish, millet, and sugarcane, and ironworking technology likely facilitated the spread. 
Although iron technology may not have been invented or introduced by bond tools and the travelers did not initially practice it, it is postulated that it, it allowed them to export forest niches. In Central Africa, it is thought that iron technology and agriculture complemented each other because the metal allowed the clearing of the forest and that in turn provided hardwood for the purification of the ore. Now, I want y'all to remember this as well. So we're gonna come back and touch on iron working technology and the importance of agriculture. Because these things, we understand the Bantus didn't invent it in Africa. So where did they get this information from? Where did they get the skill set from? It didn't fall out the sky. That's going to be a very important point. Also, the Bantus were the dominant ones in Africa. The Bantu expansion resulted in the establishment of centralized government systems and kingdoms. For example, the Great Zimbabwe. I want to touch on that for a minute because a lot of people try to stick us in Western Africa and say, oh, you're just in Western Africa. But we've been all over, West, North, East, South, all over. If you know the history of the Bantus, they were all over Africa. And they're known for their governments, their systems, and kingdoms such as Great Zimbabwe. Allowing for efficient trade within the Bantu domain with Arab and Persian traders. And they were known for trade. So we wasn't just running around Africa wearing no shirt and, and, and draws, being savages. These are wise men that understood government and trade. It says, as well as the assimilation or elimination, listen to this, the assimilation or elimination of many native populations. Why do I bring this up? Because a lot of y'all that, that, that hate the, the biblical narrative will get mad when the Bible says the same exact thing. You either get down or you lay down. When we did the conquest of Canaan, we, 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 we pretty much put that peace off out there. Are, are you either going to be peaceful with us, we can do this the easy way, or we can do it the hard way. Assimilate or eliminate. This is how the Bantus got down. <laughs> it says the Bantus have impacted a number of autochthonous groups throughout Africa, including the Cushitics, Pygmies, the Sun, and the Nilo Saharans. These are all Hamites. So we came through that wrecking shop. It was like, look, you either assimilate or get eliminated. Which one you want? This is history. You can get mad at the history all you want. This is what happened. This is what we did in Africa. And the source is ancestral DNA again. Same source, page number 409. The Bantu take over Africa. It says, independent of whether the Bantu dispersion resulted from transmission of ideas and technology, actual movement of people or a combination of the two. The fact is that it's, that its aftermath has been profound in and outside of Africa. Remember that. <laughs> so key point. Actively and passively, the Bantu phenomenon changed sub-Saharan Africa and beyond. Why? Because we was going through wreck and shop. We were, we were establishing ourselves as the top dogs, right? Because we had agriculture, we had iron working tools. We were better fitted, right? And those that were doing hunting gathering, as the pygmies and the, the, those 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 nilotes, they had to you know get down and lay down. It's actively and passively the Bantu phenomenon changed Sub-Saharan Africa and beyond forever. In general, it had a powerful homogenization effect, reducing the amount of diversity. Most of the autochthonous populations south of the Sahara were impacted. This is why a majority of Africa now is haplogroup E because of this event that happened 3,000 years ago, circa 3,000 years ago, right? It says, to various extents, native groups lost their languages and culture. This wealth of heritage vanished almost completely in some instances and partially in others. The strength of the Bantu punch was strong, was strong and varied depending on the local social cultural conditions at the time of the initial encounter and soon after. The end result of these processes was the assimilation of the Bantu way of life by the indigenous people and the elimination of NATO singularities. Wait, so that's what our ancestors did. The Bantus did that. But when we read the Bible and it tells you pretty much <laughs> how the Israelites got down, you got a problem with that. But that's how ancient tribe did it. They went through, they established themselves as, as the top dog, and you either assimilated or got eliminated. That's it. 
So when we when we read passages like in Isaiah where in the world to come is, and it says if the if a nation don't keep the um the, the the feast of tabernacles, I believe I might be wrong, if I'm not mistaken, then it will be no rain going to their city or their land. That's pretty much assimilate or get eliminated model, the same thing these bond tools were doing. So if you got a problem with that, you got a problem with your ancestors, man. Same book, page number 49410. The significance of the agrarian Bantus. Furthermore, domestication of animals was spread into areas where it was not previously practiced. Why? Why, why was this a thing? Because most people were hunter and hunter-gatherers. They did not domesticate animals in Africa. We had to bring that understanding to them. That's why I read Sirach 44 and prefaced that. We brought that understanding. We taught them how to do that. You understand? It says, these changes brought with them profound shifts in social cultural modes, as in other worldwide places where agriculture and domestication originated and flourished. In sub-Saharan Africa, it allowed for the storage of surplus food. This event had profound consequences. It freed humans from having to search for sustenance on a daily basis. The previously practiced foraging way of life demanded considerable amount of time and effort. As agrarians, People were now able to feed on previously accumulated supplies such as grains and dry meat, as well as continuous source of milk and dairy products. So same source. So this was the power of being agrarian and, not, and, and, and shifting from being hunter-gatherers. So we brought this way into Africa, and this led to civilization. Because you can't be hunter-gatherer and be civilized because you're spending most of your time trying to hunt and find food, especially during the lean months. The lean months when there's not enough not enough game out there, you're gonna you, you, your population is going to decrease because you're going to die from starvation. So there is no building and growing into these um, great, magnificent cities and governments. And you don't have the free time to really think and set up these governments and set up these technologies and learn how to do certain skills and trades. So this is why it's so significant of what the Bantus brought to Africa. You understand? Our ancestors. And the iron complemented the agrarians. And this is how. It says, in a parallel to the agrarian revolution, it was the acquisition and propagation of iron technology. Although iron is more difficult and time-consuming to purify than copper as a material for tool manufacturing, it has greater strength and durability. Iron was used by the Bantus to clear the forest, plow the fields, harvest the crops, cook, eat, build homes, create artistic expressions, and defend themselves. In general, iron greatly extended the ecological niches available to the Bantus and ex expedited their territorial advances. Therefore, developments in metallurgy complemented the advance of agriculture, and both were key in moving forward the band to civilization at unprecedented speed. So when they figured out how to, how to smelt iron and do iron metallurgy, that made them be the top dog. You understand? They established the hierarchy right there because they was able to do things at an unprecedented speed. In other words, iron tools facilitated the clearing of the forest, which in turn provided hardwood essential for reaching high temperatures required, required for the purification of the ore. Same book, page 49410. Bond to societal development. These changes in turn provided for a cascade of developments. It obliterated the need for foraging in humans had more leisure time to rest, think, and more importantly, be creative. This is why you see agriculture as the root of civilization. Because if you're hunting and gathering, that's primitive. You can't think. You have time to rest. You're always worried about surviving. But once you have a surplus of food, now you can be creative. Now you can invent. Now you can work on irrigation. Now you can work on city planning. You understand? Building uh, permanent dwellings. How to increase and boost technology. Trade. You can do all these things once you have a food source that you don't have to go out every day and find food and worry about lean months when the game are not out. 
says, although time to meditate and conceive ideas is usually ignored as an important byproduct of agrarian society, it likely fuels the genesis of discovery. Discover the, the additional food also allowed for population growth and the establishment of permanent se settlements and then evolved into larger towns and cities. The physical landscape of these extended settlements contrasted distinctly with the foraging style of, or village way of living. Households went from mud dung huts to impressive walled cities, city states such as Great Zimbabwe. So you can see how the agrarian lifestyle, the agricultural lifestyle that was brought in and established by the Bantu people changed the whole game. They went from mud dung huts to great walled city states. Man. That's a huge leap in a short amount of time. Again, the source is always going to be on the bottom of the string. It says pros and cons of the expansion. The development of large homesteads brought positive and negative outcomes on one hand. It allowed for a centralized government that facilitated law and order. It gave its citizens a sense of community. It promoted technical specialization in individuals with expertise in specific trades and functions with the potential to excel. It stimulated local and distant trade and provided protection from invaders and enemies. On the other hand, it could have generated a tyrannical and corrupt the ruling class that victimized lower classes, which we're going to touch on that on the next slide. But I want you guys to soak in what all of this development and all of this, this technological advances that the Bantus brought into Africa. You understand? They were way more advanced than the Pygmies, the Nilotes, uh, any other group that preceded them. And they outpaced them, quite frankly. And now y'all not going to hear this on any other channel. Y'all not going to hear it like that because they got to keep up the lie that all Africans are the same or everybody in Africa is all the same. That's a lie. Bantus are primarily half little group E and those other groups are A and B. They're different groups of people. And that's the same book, page number 410, 411. Again, if you're following along, the source is always going to be at the bottom of the stream. The pigments were subservient to the Bantus. Pygmies share certain characteristics in common. They are a forest people from equatorial Africa. Their short stature is genetically determined. They practice a simple, non-hierarchical societal existence based on hunting and gathering and exhibit subservient relationships with neighboring agricultural groups such as the Bantus. So I ain't got to make this up, man. It's right here. It's etched in stone already. So we're going to keep going, man. Now, 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 this is where we're going to get into the meat and potatoes. The Bantu material culture. These early, early Bantus also brought with them agricultural technology, which included crops such as banana, yam, coconut, sorghum, millet, cow peas, and melons, in addition to iron and copper metal urgy. Although, th although these domesticated Domesticated species were transported by advancing Bantus along eastern and western African streams. Many had origins outside of Africa. Now, here we go. This is why, through my, through my studies, I've, I, I can see these Bantus originating outside of Africa and then radiating into Africa. Why? Because everything that they had was foreign to Africa. The foods the metallurgy, the skills they had, everything else is foreign from Africa. But you want to assume that they were in it. No, they came. We're going to show you. We're going to show you. For example, the humpback cattle is from India, whereas chickens, bananas, and coconuts were imports from Southeast Asia. How did these people get these foods, these foreign foods that don't belong in the continent of Africa? They had to obviously come from another area and it culturally diffused into Africa as they radiated into Africa. Same source, Ancestral DNA by Rain J. Herrera, page number 430, 431. Bantu spread crops of Asian origin. Additionally, crops of Asian origins could have been introduced into East Africa via Austronesian Madagascar into Mozamb Mozambique and more recently involving with Involving trade with Arabs in the Near East. In the Near East. Same book. 
page number 430, 431. How would they have these relationships? Maybe because they they from there. They from the Near East. They familiar with the crops. They familiar how to grow the crops. They familiar with metallurgy. They skipped copper. They went straight to iron metallurgy and metal iron smelting, which we're going to get into. That's a very di difficult thing to do that had to be passed down for them. You understand why? Because these people don't belong in Africa. They came outside of Africa because all of the material and their understanding and their skill sets is coming from outside of Africa. I mean, it's a no-brainer to me. Haplogroup E associated with agriculture. Haplogroup E distributed across much of the continent of Africa and may be associated with the spread of pastoral and agricultural communities. And that's from the DNA for ar 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 archaeologist by Elizabeth Matasso, page number 9899. And we know agriculture stems from the Fertile Crescent. Some of the best documented cases our agriculture and domestication, which appeared singly in Anatolia, the Fertile Crescent, 10,000 years ago. Ancestral DNA by Rain J. Herrera, page number 427, 428. So the ability to, to do agriculture, the metallurgy, the crops, and the domesticated animals, the chickens, the cows, they're getting this from Asia. So these people must have been familiar with that terrain to get and import these things into Africa. So everything they're doing is Western Asian. Everything about these people are Western Asian. But you guys are so stuck on the 18th century model of race that you think these people have to be African. They have to be autochthonous, even though they tell you in this book they're not autochthonous to Africa. They came in and displaced the real Autochthonous Africans, meaning the original Africans. Unknown plants, animals, and technology. The archaeological evidence shows that Bantus moved south with an assemblage of tools, technologies, livestock, and plants not seen before among native populations. Because they was getting this stuff from Western Asia. And it diffused into Africa. I mean, it's clear to me. <laughs> this is very clear. Ancestral DNA, same same book, page number 430, 431. The Bantu narrative corroborated. This is a very eclectic this discipline that is nourished by data from a number of seemingly unrelated sources. It is particularly powerful when it corroborates with other fields such as linguistics, archaeology, and anthropology. Right? So we're going to use anthropology, archaeology to even further corroborate the Asian model of the Bantus. So the Bantu E markers are E1B1A V38, E2M1M75, E1B1A1A-M180. Those are the three major Bantu E markers. So more proof. Remember, I just read to you. One of the E markers is EV38, which is E1B1A. And, and if we look at Ramesses III's paternal lineage, it says Ramesses III's paternal lineage belongs to haplogroup EV38, from which your line also stems because this is coming from my DNA results. So you and Ramesses III share an ancient paternal line ancestor who, check this out, who probably lived in North Africa or what? Western Asia. Western Asia. This goes with exactly what we just read, that the cattle, the chicken, the crops, the melons, everything they had came from outside of Africa. And when they came to the natives, the natives didn't know what the hell that stuff was. They was not familiar with any of those foods, any of those crops, any of those animals. They were not familiar with metallurgy, iron metallurgy. They were not familiar with any of these things. This was coming from Western Asia. And that's why 23andMe.com corroborates this with the EV38, having a, a paternal ancestor coming from Western Asia. So to me, it's clear. It's crystal clear. These Bantus are coming from this area and this locality. And we're marrying those ideas today on the source. Now, we're going to use archaeology, anthropology, right, 
to to even like we just read to marry these ideas with the DNA, with with the fact that we know what foods and cattle, I mean, and cattle and livestock they had and the skills they had, the agriculture, they were agrarian. Where did that come from? In Mauritania, according to Arab sources, in certain oral traditions of Western Africa, the first inhabitants of Western Africa were the Bafour, whose Jewish origin is enigmatic and controversial, following a process of organization, functioning, and decline of all Sudanese empires described by Charles Montel. One might assume that Bafour Empire existed several centuries before Islam. It did. We're reading about it. And remember the decline of Sudanese empires. Remember what the Bunt, what I read to you, what the Bantus came here and did. You know what I'm saying? They came in, displaced the native powers that were there, the native uh, inhabitants, the autochthonous Africans. This is what they're saying that these people of Jewish origin did. You understand? And I'm making the connection because of the Western Asian um, cattle skill set it's all corroborating and this is what this is saying here it says um one might assume that a Balfour empire existed several centuries before islam these Balfour seem to have introduced the cultivation of palm trees horse breeding new irrigation methods in metallurgy remember we brought that out they were masters of metallurgy iron metallurgy and they used it to clear forces they use these things and technologies to, to be the top dog in ancient Africa. It says, according to a tradition reported by Andre J. Lucas, the before were the first ones to plant palm trees and to dig deep and large wells. The Mulam craftsmen make and have always made works of art. They are called Yahud because according to the legend, only Jews in Mauritania were craftsmen. And you know the Mualim have neither homeland nor tribe. And that's from the Black Jews of Africa by Edith Bruder, page number 108. So now let's deal with the Sub-Saharan African DNA dates. Because I know we're going to get scoffers. Oh, he's connecting bond tools with Israelites and Jews. And I'm just, I'm putting everything together, man. I'm putting the anthropology together with the genetics. I'm putting everything together to make a strong case for this. So let's deal with the Sub-Saharan African DNA, which in this um, in this DNA, in in this study they use Yaruba as as the uh, the base for this. It says a striking finding from our study is consistent detection of three to five percent Sub-Saharan African ancestry in eight diverse Jewish groups we study. The point. Estim estimates over all eight populations are between 1,600 to 3,400 years ago, but with largely largely overlapping confidence intervals. A parsimonious explanation for these observations is that they reflect a history in which many of the Jewish groups descend, listen now, from a common ancestral population which was itself admixed with Africans, prior to the beginning of the Jewish diaspora that occurred in the 8th to 6th century BC. So this corroborates with these bond tools bringing in this Western Asian technology, crops, and livestock. We see their microsatellites and their genetic signature in Israel, in the Levant, right? And we see them having cultural diffusion and bringing those technologies into Africa. It's clear. Source, the history of African gene flow into Southern Europeans, Levantines, and Jews by Marjani et al. Now let's deal with chicken consumption because the Bantus also had chickens, which also come from Asia. So the world's first period of industrial growth of chickens and eggs for mass consumption began in Israel's Judean lowlands of Lachish some 2,300 years ago. Hundreds of years of gradual acclimatization of roosters in the southern Mediterranean Levant 
along with gradual adoption of this animal in the Middle Eastern economy, probably created a strain of rooster suitable for economic exploitation, the re researchers concluded, meaning this is where they started to consume and eat chicken, was in Palestine, in Israel. And you see this culture being diffused into Africa. What do you guys uh, associate West Africans with? Fried chicken, man. <laughs> This is more evidence of cultural diffusion. So we got the DNA, we got the traits, we, we got them eating chicken, we got the we got them having the cattle, we got them having grain, melons coming from this area, from this region, Asia. The source is chickens first commercialized in Israel 2,300 years ago, researchers say, by Daniel K. Eisenberg, July 21st, 2015, the Jerusalem Post is where you can find an article. Chicken eating bond tools. It says, but it's not known that as they migrated south, they took with them at least two species of cattle. I mean, but it is known that as they migrated south, they took with them two species of cattle, the humpback and the flatback, as well as the chicken and goats. Now, the humpback came from Asia and the chicken and goats. I mean, the chickens came from Asia, right? So these people were consuming and eating chicken, <laughs> which was first, the evidence of it first being exploited was in Israel, another connection to ancient Israel and the Bantus. Ancestral DNA is the book by Rain J. Harry, page number 430. Chickens are introduced from Asia. Although the African continent is rich in galliform species, the recognized main wild ancestor of domestic chickens, the red jungle fowl, is endemic to sub-Himalayan northern India, southern China, and Southeast Asia. Therefore, domestic chickens, though abundant on the continent, are an introduced species from Asia. Why? Because you had these people in Israel and Palestine bringing this culture into Africa. Strong hypothesis, if you ask me. The source is the history of African village chickens in archaeological and molecular perspective by J.M. Memoir on Springer.com. Now let's deal with the iron metallurgy. Iron working was developed for the first time in Anatolia, pre present day Eastern Turkey, approximately 3,500 years ago. The, make of, the making of iron is not simple as smelting copper or tin which are just melted and collected from the rock. In the case of iron, the impure metalliferous rock that is mined needs first to be pulverized to increase surface area. Then it requires to be heated in a furnace at a high temperatures to initiate a chemical deoxygenation reaction involving the ore and the added carbon and charcoal. And th this is just proven. They, they could not have just been isolated in Africa and just understand this. This is a very um, skill-based thing that you just don't wake up one day and learn iron smelting. And that's Ancestral DNA, page number 424, 425. It says the amount of carbon in the mixture is critical. Too much or too little charcoal ruins the process. This reaction takes advantage of the carbon atom's affinity to bind to oxygen and doing so, so removing it from the ore. The products of this reaction are CO, CO2, and a semi-refined form of iron. In addition, lime is usually added in the form of seashells to remove a number of rocky impurities in the ore. How did these Bantus understand this? How did they know how to do this? I'm going to tell you how, because they come from the region where it, it started at, and they brought that technology into Africa. That's what I've been showing you for the past 30, 45 minutes. This is a very complex thing that they're doing. You got to know about the limestones. You got to know how to take how to take the uh, to deoxify it. You got to know how to take the lumps and impurities out of it. You understand? It says too much or too little charcoal ruins the process. So you got to know that's called the Goldilocks effect. It got to be just right. So these people came with this knowledge and understanding already. It says the heat provided by the boiler acts as a catalyst that transforms the limestone and the, the oxygen from the ore to calcium oxide. 
The solid contaminants are removed as a slag from the bottom of the furnaces at the end of the smelting process. Same book, page number 424 and 425. The process initiated when the mixture of ore, charcoal, and lime is placed in the furnace. Fire is initiated and air is blown continuously with hand-powered bellows to increase the temperature. The, the smelting process continued for hours into the night. Subsequently, the crude iron is retrieved from the boiler while hot and hammered to remove impurities further and mold it into shapes and tools. Because of the rather complicated nature of this process, it was assumed for many years that iron making was an acquired knowledge imported from Southwestern Asia. Ain't that what I've been telling y'all all, all night? That's the whole purpose of this video. Ancestral DNA, page number 427, 428. Limba Eurasian gene flow. The oral history of the limba forms the basis uh, for the most theories concerning their origins. The Zimbabwean limba have a tradition that they came from the north and that their fathers did skilled, there it goes, metalwork for the Arabs. This ties them, why? Because the limba, people think the limba are just a bunch of uh, Africans that have um, foreign DNA. Some of them do. You understand? Some of them do have J and T, but a lot of them have E, M2, or EV38, or E1P1A. So this corroborates with the Bantu expansion. Their fathers did skill metal work, and they tie these people to people living in the Levant or living in Eurasia. So it's the answer of how they came to these understandings and this skill on how to you how to how to perform metal energy. Iron metallurgy is clear. Why they have chicken? Why they have crops that come from this area? Quite frankly, they're they're from that area. And the source of the origin of the limba, black Jews of Southern Africa. Limba metallurgy from Western Asia as well. It says they were highly regarded as master metal workers in copper and, and, and iron, copper, and gold, and as skilled potters, the men used to the men used to wear a long cotton gar garment, a consu, as found along the east coast of Africa. Same source. The Limba Judaic laws. In addition, the Limba are culturally quite distinct from other Bantu speakers in that they practice a religion that embraces many extraordinary rituals and laws. Although the assimilation of the Limba into modern South African society is slowly eroding their culture, many of the rural Limba still follow traditional ways, marriage laws, and care strict endogamy, and acceptance of non limba men into the community is especially rare. Male circumcision is practiced, and limba boys are initiated, initiated about the time of puberty in secret closed lodges. The stringent food laws appear to be essentially Jewish. Why am I bringing up the limba? Because EM2 is in their matrices. They're bond too. A lot of them are bond too. Descendants. Because a lot of people are confused. Oh, Bantu's a language group. Yeah, but we're talking about those people that brought this culture into Af to Africa. We gave you the three major groups earlier in, in this presentation. Eurasian admixture proves SSA or uh, Sub-Saharan Africans were in the Levant. A study of su uh, Southern African genes showed that unexpectedly another migration took West Euro Western Eurasian DNA back to the very southern tip of the continent 3,000 years, years ago. Hmm, that's around the time of the bond to expansion. <laughs> you see how that work? Uh, the source is Humanity's Forgotten Return to Africa Revealed in DNA by Catherine. Uh, you can find it on New Scientist. It was published February the 3rd, 2014. Motorman proves Eurasian gene flow. It says tracing the migration of anatomically modern humans has been complicated by human movements uh, both out and into Africa, especially in relatively recent history. Uh, Gal Galago Lorante sequenced the, an Ethiopian individual, Mota, who lived approximately 4,500 years ago, predating one such wave of individuals into Africa from Eurasia. So here we present 12.5 coverage of ancient genome of the Ethiopian male, Mota, who lived approximately 4,500 4, years ago. We use this genome to demonstrate that 
the Eurasian bat flu in Africa came from a population closely related to early Neolithic, you see that? Farmers who had colonized Europe 4,000 years earlier. So it's all full circle. This is how the Bantus acquired an agrarian lifestyle, agriculture. This is what sparked civilization because they came from these areas and they came from and descend from these people that already had these technologies down pack. And we know the DNA of Motaman. Motaman was EP2. EP2 is what creates E1B1A, E1B1B. And the source of the ancient Ethiopian genomes reveal extensive Eurasian admixture in Eastern Africa. And admixture uh, just proves that um, they were around those people. Their autosomes show that they were around other accepted Eurasian um, people. Migratory data supports the thesis. Historic migrations from Eurasia into Africa have affected many contemporary populations' confounding inferences. Why does it confound inferences? Because in the past, people used to teach that sub-Saharan um, sub -Saharan Africans were landlocked and they didn't do any trade and they didn't, they didn't do anything outside of sub-Saharan Africa. That is false. We prove that today. Because how else would they be able to acquire the knowledge of metallurgy to have chickens that are foreign to Africa, to have uh, the humpback cattle that are foreign to Africa and have all of the grain and cereals that are foreign to Africa? and have the agrarian lifestyle that was foreign to Africa until they brought it into and introduced it to Africa. These people migrated from Eurasia, man, Western Asia. Who's been telling y'all this this whole time? The Israelite community. They are the ones who have been telling you this this whole time. And now anthropology, genetics is catching up to that. The source of ancient Ethiopian genomes reveals extensive Eurasian admixture in Eastern Africa. Again, same sort. Uh, so the NRI DNA, the Y chromosome of Motaman is E1B1, which is EP2, right? And it says the macro haplogroup E is the most prevalent haplogroup found in Africa with reduced frequencies in Europe and the Middle East. Why is the most uh, frequent? Because the Bantus went in and displaced the natives of Africa. That's why. Uh, President Mota represents the most widespread subclade of haplogroup E and has been found at high frequency in modern Ethiopians. Source of supplementary materials for ancient Ethiopian genome reveals extensive Eurasian admixture in Eastern Africa. The Natufians, again, the Natufians, they were farmers, you understand? And we were connecting these people, the farmers, the Natufians, to the Bantus, because they were also E1B1. So this individual derived from the mutation P179 defining haplogroup E1B1 and upstream mutation M5403 defining haplogroup E. So we see, and we know the Natufians dwelt where? In Israel. And we know they was farmers. And they were agrarian as well. And then you see the Bantus being agrarian and having all these Western Asian features and properties. It's clear. They're the same people. <laughs> Let's get it. Basal Eurasian. I said this is supportive of the idea that Basal Eurasian ancestry and earliest population of Levant, the Natufians, and in virtually all other West, ancient Western Eurasians, including the ancient Iran, is from the same population. Our finding that at least the Natufians had a Y chromosome of African origin suggested to us initially that gene flow from Africa, which did not experience Neanderthal admixture, may have contributed basal Eurasian ancestry into the ancient Near East. And basal means first, the base. You understand? Supplemental information to genetic structure of the world's first farmers by Lazarus. By RXIV is where you can get that. It was published July 25th, 2016. The ultimate origin of EP2. The existence of the haplogroup E1B1 in ancient East Africa and nearby Levant and the two earliest samples from both regions raises questions about its alter, ultimate origin. Why? Because they find this DNA in the Levant. So we found the Natufian DNA in the Levant. We found that Sub-Saharan African DNA is in all distinct eight groups, Jewish groups, and it dates all the way back to the 8th century 
uh, BC and beyond, placing our people in the Levant. This is putting our ancestors in the Levant, like we've been telling y'all for years. The community has been telling y'all this for years, that that's our legacy, that's our history, that's where we're from. It says, this haplogroup group consists, continues to exist in the pre priority Neolithic period. Basal Eurasians are, are so named because of their phylogenetic position, basal to other Eurasians, meaning first. Supplementary information, genetic structure of the world's first form, the same source. The African Natufians, we observed that all three Natufian individuals that could be assigned to a specific haplogroup belong to haplogroup E1B1. This is thought to have an East African origin and a 4,500-year-old individual from Ethiopian highlands belong to it. And the African origin of Natufian has been proposed based on the sub-Saharan, listen to this, cranial morphology in comparison to late, later West Eurasian samples. So they have the same cranial morphology of a sub-Saharan, which, I mean, that's something that you can look at because they're E1B1, and E1B1 produces E1B1A and E1B1B. And the source, it's the same source. So even Proto-Afro-Asiatic comes from the EP2 mutation or EP2 carriers, such as the Natufians. It says the, pro the Proto-Afro-Asiatic group carrying the EP2 mutation may have appeared at this point in time, subsequently gave rise to the different major population groups, including current speakers of Afro-Asian languages and pastoralist populations. You understand? So we're tying it all together. And that's from Y chromosome E haplogroup. So they're related to the Natufians, Natufians, are farmers, the farmer that explains the, the agriculture and agrarian society um, which the Bantus introduced into Africa and how they got the understanding of that and bringing it there because they came from that area, the Levant, and, and swept into Africa and took over Africa. The origin of half, even the origin of haplogroup E. It says most Y chromosome haplogroup diversity in Africa, however, is present within macro haplogroup E, seem to have appeared 21 to 32,000 years before present, somewhere between the Red Sea and Lake Chad. Now, where's the Red Sea? Y'all know where the Red Sea is, man. Y'all know where it's at. The EP2 represent the most numerous in Africa. The majority of males in most regions of Africa bear E haplogroups defined by the M96 marker. Why is that? It says the P2 is ancestral to both V38 slash M2 found in most of infra-Saharan uh, tropical Africa M215 M33 violent uh, lineages, which is E1B1A and E1B1B. The latter found from Eastern Africa up to Egypt to Morocco. The E haplogroup family tree shows that the P2 descendants lineages are deep within the family tree and not at its base. It is interesting that the split in the family occurred in the tropical Africa. The P2 descendants are the most numerous, although there are other terminal subclades within E. It bears repeating that the lineages that seem to be the most common in supra-Saharan, infra-Saharan Africa have a common origin in having a P2 ancestor. And who are these P2 ancestors? These Natufians coming from Israel, explaining the Bantus, having this understanding and knowledge that's foreign to Africa. And that's the genetics of African populations by Ibrahim Muntazer, page number 36. Judaic roots and uh, material culture. What slide am I on? 42, 42. I got three more. The impact of foreign influence in the construction of the Great Zimbabwe has received renewed interest with the claims that the Limba people, architectural candidates of the complex, have Judaic roots. A list of parallelisms between Jewish and Limba practices include observing Shabbat, self-identification as a chosen people, restriction of a diet as an in in indicated in the Torah, as well as abst abstention from eating pig, ritual slaughters, circumcision and restrain from marrying outside of the group. So it's clear. So you have these limbas. Can remember, limba are not just haplogroup J and T. They're also EM2 and have haplogroup E. So inadvertently, when you bring up the limba, you're bringing up haplogroup E, you're bringing up Bantus, and you're bringing up their ties to Judaic culture. Inadvertently. And that's from Ancestral DNA by Rain J. Harea, page number four. 
439. And again, the Levant was dominated by haplogroup E. Okay, we gave you three specimens have E1, B1 uh, from that period. So this fine contrasts with both early Neolithic and Epipaleolithic Levantine po populations, which were dominated by haplogroup E. And later Bronze Age individuals are all whom belong to haplogroup J. A lot of y'all don't understand haplogroup J came later. But before, E dominated that area, explaining the Bantu expansion and how they had all this understanding foreign to Africa and native to Asia. Source ancient DNA from Calcolithic Israel reveals the role of population mixture and cultural transformation. You can find it on Nature, published August 20, 20 of 2018. Uh, Levant is connected to Africa. It says such a scenario would also explain the presence of Y chromosome haplogroup E in the Natufians and Levantine farmers, a common link between the Levant and Africa. And as the Paleolithic DNA from Caucasus reveals core of West Eur Eurasian ancestry. And Los of Lazarus did the article on September 21st, 2018. Now, the Eurasian haplogroup E. The most parsimonious interpretation of the Y chromosome phylogeny constructed with these variants is that the predominant African haplogroup E, now listen to this, arose outside the continent and back migrated into Africa. This was published in 2018. The geneticist uh, Cabrera is saying that this is the origin of haplogroup E. It arose outside of the continent, and they're saying Asia is the point of origin, which this ties with all the information that we spoke about today with the bond tools. How did they get the, uh, the information? How did they get the technology? How did they get iron metallurgy? How did they, how did they uh, um, get the cultural diffusion of chicken consumption? You understand? We read to you all of these foods and uh, these skills were foreign to Africa. Why? Because you had an Asiatic group bringing these, these technologies into Africa and displacing the autochthonous tribes. That's just history. And that marks the end of my presentation. All right, so let me see the comments, see how everybody doing. Let me see what y'all, where y'all mind at, man? We finished in an hour. That's good, man. What's good, man? What's, what's the temperature of the room? The temperature of the room. Shout out to the family, man. Hit that like button. Share and subscribe. Uh, uh, shout out to Levi from the tribe of Judah. He said, it is, it's basically the Canaanite conquest 2.0. 2. Exactly. That's what was going on. <laughs> it was going in there smacking up on Hamites and laying the law down. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Medicine Man turned me on to you. Truth, wholeness, and power. Why are everybody talking about this brother named Medicine Man, man? I, I don't even know this brother. People have been bringing up this brother, man. Well, shout out to him. Let me see. Akmalak said, Battle Axe did a debate on the Bantu expansion pool. They were actually Israelites. Bantu means the people. Yeah, I understand what Bantu means. Yeah, Akmalak said, check out the debate between Battle Axe and Emac. So a bunch of people. We are all on one. Hey, 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 uh, real quick, Joshua. Akman Lock, man. Uh that email didn't work, man. You gotta you gotta <laughs> send me something, bro. Hey, Akman ASAP, Lock, man. ASAP. If you still watching, man, he said the email didn't work. Uh classes and sessions said that's why they keep saying that we are Canaanites. Yeah, I mean, you can't make that assertion because, again, haplogroup E don't got nothing to do, nothing to do with uh, Canaanites. Hey, much love, Levi. All right, man, it's been a long day, man. I ain't going to be on here. I ain't going to hold y'all too long. Just had to go ahead and get that information out there. Y'all see the proof. You see the evidence. see the sources. Pretty much made the corroboration uh, of a Western origin, of Western Asian origin. Uh, the Bantu people. I mean, how else y'all going to explain the technology and the understanding of iron metal energy and, and the foods and the agrarian culture that was foreign to Africa? I don't know how else y'all going to explain it, man, unless y'all just make up some stuff. <laughs> That's all you can do. 
Hey, hey, man, let me ask you this, man. Um, the Bantu origins is that Southeast Africa? Well, see, I covered that. I covered that in the beginning. I killed that in the beginning. That's one of the theories. You understand? Right. But that's not built on no solid foundation. You understand? And they don't explain if they was from South Africa, why all of the people in South Africa didn't know what the hell they had. You understand? They were, that, everything they brought to those areas was foreign to them. If they was from there, they would have been well accustomed to it already. So you, know you gotta you gotta forgive me, man, because you might have you might have covered this. I, I gotta go back and watch this, man. I'm managing a whole bunch of things, man. But uh are, are are you are you saying that the um Bantus migrated into Africa? That's exactly what the whole purpose of this video was to show mm. that they came from Western Asia mm. and, and migrated into Africa and took over and dominated a wreck shop. You know what I'm saying? And them hammites didn't stand a chance. <laughs> All right, so something something I'm confused about uh the time timeline, right? Yeah. So are they saying Bantu, because Bantu is older, it goes back to the time of Shem, right? No. No. Mm. They say around 3,000 years ago. That's like 1,000 BCE. But again, that's an approximation. That's not an exact date, but nobody's pushing it four or 5,000 years ago. Mm. Bantu expansion happened about 3,000 years ago. Reason I'm saying this is because I, I've gotten into it with, with, with BJM concerning this, and he claims or asserts that the Bantu is the oldest civilization in the history of mankind. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest. Everything, everything come from the Bantu. No. Bantu pygmy twat. That's a Bantu pygmy twat. Have you heard him say that? Yeah, I heard him say that madness, man. Black Jesus. Hey, matter of fact, Black Jesus Menace, you know I'm the HOK champion, man. You can't even speak, bro. <laughs> but um, um no, man, civilization start with ag agriculture. I, I I brought that out. You gotta have agriculture. Can't be a hunter-gatherer civilization because you're too busy worried about feeding yourself and hunting the, 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 the game, going out there and hunt antelopes and stuff. You can't be doing that and creating civilization. So once you create, uh, once you understand agriculture and you're able to plant, plant your food and have a surplus of food, now you got time to think, build, and be creative. You understand? And, and learn trades and learn new skills. That's that's the foundation of civilization. And that don't start in Africa. That's starting the Fertile Crescent. I read that today. Agriculture starting the Fertile Crescent. So therefore, civilization starts in the Fertile Crescent. That's so, uh, according to your research, are there any scholars that 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 is uh that that is uh, uh saying this about the Bantu that uh they are the uh uh oldest civilization? Have you seen anything like that? <laughs> no, I ain't never seen that. That's silly. Mm. That's I haven't personally seen anything like that. Old civilization is going to be Urdu and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? In Mesopotamia, you're not going to get no, you know what I'm saying, old civilization like that in Africa. There's no evidence of that. So are you saying that Africa is not the motherland, brother? Is that, is that what you're saying to the people right now, brother? Man, I'm standing on that. I'm not just saying <laughs> Africa is not the motherland. Yes, we went in there and dominated and pretty much ruled the whole continent at a point of time. That is, that's what the bond to expansion is. Our ancestors going in and taking control and pretty much dominating the whole the whole continent. So you you, you got to forgive me, man. You got to forgive me because you probably covered this, right? Mm -hmm. So the people that they went into, who were the people that were there when they went into into so called Africa? The, the the Khoisan, um, the forest people known as the Bushmen, the Pygmy, um, the Nilotic, some Nilotes, you know what I'm saying, the Sun people. And those so, are all Hamites. And yeah, my, I, was just about to, I was just about to ask you that. They're all uh, Hamites. Them all Hamites. Shem came in, the Shemites came in, the Hamites was there. Like the brother said, it was basically the con Conquest of Canaan 2.0. <laughs> That's what the Bond 2 expansion was, man. <laughs> right. 
Hey, uh, real quick, uh, Akma Lock, I know it says that it was sent, but when I went to open up the picture, nothing came up, bro. So that's why I'm telling you, send it to me on Facebook, brother Messenger. Or text it to me or something, man. I mean, we got to get this thing underway, man, so I get these flyers out, man. We busy over here at the source. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get that, get that, uh, get that established, man, because we trying to we don't want no issues, you know, on promotion. But uh yeah, man. Um I pr I pretty much did an exhaustive study on this and, and bringing out these slides to make that point that they ain't from Africa. They foreign to Africa. But see, that's that's the thing. How they gonna have everything? That's like you coming to America. You got Chinese letters all over you. You know what I'm saying? All your clothes is Chinese silk. You know what I'm saying? And then somebody going to say, man, you from Africa. No, bro. Look at him. Everything he got represent China. How is you going to say this man is from Africa? Are he from Europe? That's what they doing with the bond too. Everything they got represent Western Asia. But you're going to say that these people are originally from Africa. I don't understand it if all the evidence is pointing to a foreign land outside of Africa. That was basically my argument all night. You know what I'm saying? And that's basically what I presented in my presentation. Yeah, man. I, you know, I think we're going to have to do a, uh, I think we have to do a presentation, man, and go into the research on, because uh, it's just so much confusion concerning, like, um, Africa and, 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 uh, and how uh, Kush was established because Kush came out of Mesopotamia. Nimrod created the city of Babylon, made them the Babylonians. Nimrod is the son of Kush. And then we have the Kushite Empire in Africa. You understand? Yeah, I'm not denying that either. That's, right. a fact. That's a fact. But you had Kushite tribes in, in, in um, Africa as well. And that's that's they got that work. They they either um, they either assimilated or got eliminated. You know what I'm saying? Just like every other tribe. You know what I'm saying? So nah, anybody that, denying that? Yeah, yeah. And then and then you have um um the other son uh that came out of the Kushite Empire, equating to um the Egyptians as they forged out of the Kushite Empire, which is all lining up biblically because that's exactly what the Bible say. You know what I mean? Kush being the father, uh, and and uh, wait, Kush is the brother of Mithraim, right? Yeah, Mithraim, yeah. right? So, so yeah, so him being the older brother, and then them coming and flourishing after them later, also foot the Libyans, and uh, yeah, man, so there's a lot of stuff that I want to cover and try to dive off into some of that history and information because it's important. You understand when we when we're having dialogues with with uh these afrocentric brothers, you understand? They want to they want to um, you know, they want to take a big dump on Mesopotamia as if Mesopotamia is white people. Right. They don't never talk about Mesopotamia. You understand? And and, and the black people achievements there seeing that that was created by the ancestors of the people of Africa. I covered that, man. I covered that. Not, <laughs> not two fields, you know what I'm saying? They was in the building. So you can't you yeah. can't you can't ex our ancestors out of the out of the equation. And that's what these dudes do. They ex right. their own ancestors out of the equation, out of the greatest history ever. Our ancestors brought forth agriculture, therefore our ancestors introduced civilization to the world. Why wouldn't you accept that? Why are you not proud of that? Right. You know it's like it's like your family moves to Louisiana, but they came from Cleveland. Right. And you want to honor Louisiana, but you don't want to talk about Cleveland at all. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what's sure going on. Yeah, because they too Af Afrocentric. It's in their name. You worried about Africa too damn much. No, nah, bro, that's not where we're from. <laughs> Point blank. And I, I provided enough sources in here to prove that anybody want to debate that we can do it. Like so anybody watching and you in your feelings, like you always do, just hit just hit your mirror my he gonna he gonna set that up. And I can beat your head in uh until the kingdom come. 
on that topic. You know what I'm saying? So that go for anybody. Yep, yep. Here. They want that smoke, man. So <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, and that's another. Uh, what what is the uh, what which which civilization is older? Ancient Mesopotamia, or uh, so called Africa? Then you don't. Then they then they try to say Egypt. You can't even speak about Egypt before because Kush was there before that. You understand? So then they don't even really talk about Kush. They just focused on Egypt, man. They're like I don't get it, bro. Yeah, like these people are silly. They always run the uh, Egypt, but you gotta understand, Egypt is not doing anything until agriculture come into the play and come into play. And I keep harping on that because it's true. The Neolithic Revolution happened in Mesopotamia. It didn't happen, you know what I'm saying, in Egypt. So that's the start of our civilization. And I'll debate anybody on that. Brother said, debate young Pharaoh. That if that brother come off his pedestal, I'll debate him. And he'll get he'll get the floor wiped with him, man. Talking about Egypt yeah. older. He gonna come with some pseudo stuff anyway. That dude young pseudo. Yeah, man. I, I don't I don't get why people are so in love with these rhetoric masters, man. I mean <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they, they just um uh, you know they they're 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 bewitched by <laughs> their dialogue. You know what I mean? They bewitched by these words that they're using. You understand? Like instead of being impressed with the information. You know what I mean? Like with the with, with the archaeology, with the historical merit, like those are the things that move me, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like Well, well, that's why Sarah Susan said he started off with a large following because he it's about sensationalism. He right. get up there and yell, he funny. You know what I'm saying? He gonna make you laugh. Go hurt us. That's what you niggas was. Remember that? Gonna, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Look, you that still that still hit. You know what I'm saying? So it's more about the entertainment factor to them. Than it is the education factor, and that's the problem. That'd be the problem, you know. What I'm saying, what is the man saying? What are his sources saying? Where is he getting his information from? From, or is he pulling this out of his? You know what? So, right. that's why the source is so integral to the community because we about bringing forth information and validating it and showing you where we're getting it from. We ain't hiding this stuff. We showing you exactly. This the book I'm getting it from right here. You know what I'm saying? And exactly, that, and that's that. These other brothers, they they fugazi. Uh, who's that? Jamar said, "No, not Negro. No, what? Right? Let me make this clear to everybody watching. The source ain't running from nobody, man. You understand? You come here, you dropping name dropping these these brothers, but we have uh, we have tried to get these brothers to, to to come out of their, you understand? Come out of their ancient temples, right? And battle." <laughs> They don't want to do it. They don't want to do it, man. And you tell them I said it, bro. We want all the smoke. The very first logo in, a, in, in, in promotion for the for the source was a cloud of smoke because that's what we built on. Because we right. want this information, and we want to we want to we want to confront the community with this information, and we want to move away from rhetoric masters, right? right. Your, your, your polite, your, your Dr. Reggie's, your, your whole <laughs> damn community, bring them, man. Like, we're not afraid of these guys, man. P polite made it cool to be a rhetoric master. This man right. on the street talking all type of man and the sun hurl out planets. What? <laughs> Where you that bullshit from? You just made it up on the spot. Hey, <laughs> he, he said that a, a, a penis is a woman's clitoris. I'm, I'm like, bro, what are you, what are you talking about? Excuse my language if I'm offending anybody, right. but this type of crazy, nonsensical stuff that it came out of this man's mouth, and y'all cherish him. <laughs> right, right, right. Men evolve, <laughs> men uh, evolve from women, and women are going to transition into something else. Right, right. What is, what is this, man? What, what is, what, what are we doing here, man? <laughs> Source up. What? 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 I mean, like, you know, <laughs> and, and don't get me wrong, man. I give the brother, uh, polite, a lot of credit on, you know, some of his nutrients and some of the some of the things he deal with health. You know what I mean? Like, some of those things are are, are great for the community. But when you start going into, you know, 
this other stuff. You know what I mean? Like it's just wow, man. You know what I mean? This so the same man that said he was abducted by aliens and was pretty much uh, infused with all the knowledge he got. So you can't um, question his authority because his authority come from a an alien or something. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, I, I seen, um, I seen, and, and, and then you, his master teacher is Dr. York. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, somebody, I think somebody do a, a, a breakdown on, because Polite's supposed to have wrote 37 books or something in, in a short span of time or something, you know. Uh, a lot of that, a lot of that stuff, according to the video I saw, because I ain't uh, no research on the brother, but according to what I saw, <laughs> the brother said that there, a lot of that was just cut and paste from different stuff, man. You know, what yeah. I'm saying? but this this is the type of things that impress people. You understand? <laughs> I don't get it, bro. Oh man, oh man, look, man, the sheep led to the slaughter, bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, man. You know, the black woman is God. So what I need her to do is to get on the front line, battle this white man for us, man, because. Uh, <laughs> She ain't answered none of my prayers yet, brother. I mean, you know, <laughs> we still yeah. we still impoverished. We're still uh, lowly uh, educated. We're still um, poverty stricken, right? We're still, yeah. um, uh, you know, all of these uh, social ills that plague us. A lot of it is self inflicted. You understand? Uh, it's not cool to be smart. It's not cool to to bring forth information. It's cool to be, uh, sis, you know, sensationalized. Yeah. You know, and you want to be told, and it tells you this in the, in, in the Bible, man. You understand? Pro, uh, Isaiah, um, Proverbs chapter 30, man. You know what I mean? Starting at the ninth verse says, uh, you, uh, you, want, uh, you want that smooth talk. You want to be talked to smooth. Let me get this scripture real quick, man, because it's a powerful thing. Isaiah chapter 30, starting at the ninth verse. Let me read it, man. This is our problem as a people, man. That's why I rock with the Bible, man. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot of mis misunderstanding. They want to talk to you about damn talking donkeys and uh, swallowing whales when the Bible doesn't say nothing about no uh, uh, whale. But they want to talk to you about a whale swallowing a man and you know, instead of dealing with this tangible information that, that is actually uh, beneficial to our people. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to get this script real quick, man. I know you're trying to get up out of here, man. Right? So Proverbs chapter 30. What do it say here? What do it say here? 39. That 30 might be Isaiah. 30. Yeah, it's a lucky. It's a... Uh, it's Isaiah 30, right? Let me get it real quick. Isaiah 30 and um, 30 and 9. What do it say right here? Isaiah 30 and 9, it reads, that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, which say to Joshua, See not, <laughs> prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceit. That's what you people want, man. You want to be lied to. You want to be told that you're great and you're not. And I'm talking about individuals in regards to your behavior, your conduct, and the way that you're operating with your people in your community, man. You understand? We have to be confronted and be, and it has to be required of us to do more than what we're actually doing. Yeah, man, that's Isaiah chapter uh, chapter 30, man, going in. That's so check this out, Joshua. 30, 30, and let me get this 30 and 1 real quick, man, because this is right on point with what you're saying, right? Isaiah 30 and 1, what do it say? Woe to the rebellious children, said the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that covet with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. What is this sin, Joshua? Check this out. That walk down to into Egypt and have not asked of my mouth, 
to take strength, to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Man, this book is on point. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame and the trust in the shadow of Egypt, your confusion. Woo! See that? Yeah, that's that's going to uh, make make some people catch some feelings. You know what I'm saying? That's going to that's gonna make some people catch some feelings. You mean to tell me going to Egypt <laughs> is going to uh, <laughs> cause confusion, brother? <laughs> <laughs> going back right. to Egypt going to cause confusion, brother? See, that's why I don't follow the Bible. That's that's exactly where they're gonna go. <laughs> right. Well, man, look, man, it's uh powerful information. I'm about to go back and rewatch this thing, man, again. Take notes. I hope you all were edified, man, from the brothers' work and labor. And uh, we're gonna continue to fight the good fight to the best of our ability. We don't have all the answers, we're on the hunt for knowledge. We're on a hunt to apply knowledge, which equates to wisdom, right? That way in wisdom is the application of knowledge, right? So understanding is what we're seeking through the study of knowledge. So the Bible is right and exact, and that's Isaiah 11 and, and two, you understand? So these are the things that we're trying to seek, man. You know, a lot of things, uh, they, they, they uh, try to reject these things because of translations. They want to argue with you about what well, this translation says this. Well, I, you know, that's not what it says in the original. Yeah, but this one says this. <laughs> okay, I understand it says that, brother, but this is a translation and the translator is incorrect. Now, the Bible's incorrect. So now you want to take the whole Bible and throw it away because a translator made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's what they do, man. But all praise and glory, man. I appreciate you, brother. Hey, hey, yeah. before, we, before we dip out here, let's talk about this tomato can on the screen right now. Uh, this brother said, Yashu the Canaanite, what's going on, sir? Where you going, going to get that lip plate, sir? I guess you're making fun of the Bantus. And let me let me let me let you in on something. You do understand the descendants of the Bantus represent the majority of the slaves that were shipped to America. So Woo! more likely, Judah Nazareth, you descend from a Bantu. <laughs> and right. you making fun of your ancestors and, and, and implying all this other stuff. Hey, look, listen. I'm glad you came through. Maybe you learned something. Uh, for a change. Hey, and when you ready to debate um, the Moabites, I mean, not the Moabites, the Chinese people are Canaanites. You know what I'm saying? I'll be over here at the source waiting on that. <laughs> you can hit Jeremiah up. We can set <laughs> yeah, man, I ain't gonna hold you up, man. I, I want to see that because how could you be teaching something <laughs> that you're not, that you're not, that you can't defend? Let me make this clear, right? So I'm a teacher, right? So, the, so, so I teach, right? So I have other books, right? I got, I got the book of Enoch. I got the book of Jasher. I got the, I got, I got these other external books that I study, but I don't teach that to my students. I build them on the foundation of the Bible and historical research is what we teach. When you're getting into other things that I can't substantiate a 90 foot, uh, how many cubits, a uh, 900 elves, you understand? <laughs> I, when, I can't, when I can't substantiate 900 elves, Joshua, a man standing 900 elves, if I can't substantiate that, I'm not going to teach that to my students, bro. I'm not going to teach that to them. I can't explain this. You understand? So if they decide they want to go into that research or whatever, and you know, that's on them. So I have to be responsible for what I'm teaching. And if someone calls me out on what I'm teaching, I should be able to defend that, right? I can't say I'm teaching this, but I can't defend it. Then you shouldn't teach it. Am I right <laughs> or wrong about that, Joshua? 
Hey, hey, you 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 are absolutely right. And I hope uh the tomato can the Nazareth is watching right now so he can learn his lesson, man. Stop teaching that Chinese <clears throat> Canaanite theory of yours if you can't back that stuff up, man. That's that's the moral of the story. You heard what right. your said, man. You can't back it up, but you want to sit around and spread. I didn't heard him say it over a thousand times. Of course, I'm being, you know, I'm exaggerating, but this brother say that stuff a lot, man. Right. That's what made me want to debate that anyway. I, I was like, this brother keeps saying that these Chinese people is Canaanites. What the hell is he, where is he getting this shit? You know what I'm saying? Where is he getting it from? <laughs> right. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, I've heard I heard a lot of um, scenarios that are surrounded. Um, like they say that um, the Chinese are Moab, right? Uh, you have other brothers who that would make if they were Moab, that would make them Shemites, right? Then mm -hmm. you have others that say the uh, people of India are Japhet, right? And you have others that say Chinese people are also Japhet. So. I know there, there are different things, but one thing I haven't heard, this is the first time ever. <laughs> first time ever have I heard that Chinese people are Canaanites. I have never heard that. <laughs> so I would be very interested in that debate if it took place. Yeah. For the record. Yeah. Yeah, man. I'm interested. I'm, I'm interested to see where you're getting it from because he told me to look at an airport. Bro, airport is not a name of an airport is not gonna prove where people come from, man. You know what I'm saying? They ain't gonna prove that you descend from anybody. You know what I'm saying? So if you would have came with that garbage at the debate, that would have been three oh, bro. Brothers would have told me I wasted my time. If that's all you got in the chamber, brother. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. I mean, you have to man, uh I'd be very interested because you're gonna have to now. You're going to have to bring in archaeology. You're going to have to uh, substantiate historical merit. You're going to have to um, um, examine cultural practices, right? You're going to have to examine because we know that Chinese, they have a cultural practice. They have a history um, that is very rich and very accessible. You understand? So um, I would want to see those things. You know what I mean? Cultural practice. Also, what is the migration pattern? You understand? What was the reason that they got, how did they get pushed over there? You understand? Like I said, I have others that say that there's others that say that the Chinese mm -hmm. are Moab and they connect uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar in the scriptures as pushing them, pushing Moab to the edges of the earth. I've seen that scripture. I'm not sold on it. I don't get into arguments with with, with 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 who Chinese China is because I'm trying to figure out who the hell we are. Okay. So I I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't be opposed to seeing that, man. Yeah, I'm gonna beat that dude head in. You know what I'm saying? And I ain't no secret. I I, I used to teach that Moab uh Ammon theory too. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I just got overwhelmed with a lot of evidence that those majority of those people are Japheth and maybe some of them Moab Ammon. Yeah. But not all of them. No. Uh -uh. Maybe. Those are, we got theories, bro. We don't know everything. So we got to build our best case for things. Um, right. I think brothers have a hard time admitting that, but I say it all the time on my presentation. This is my model. This is what I, you know, me building a strong case for it. Um, right. But, 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 you know, people like Judah Nazareth, they just go out and teach the stuff, don't have any information supporting his claim. And, and that's why he's hiding right now. He don't want to come out and have that discussion. Um, yeah, he said, last time he jumped on the show, he said that there are more important things to talk about. <laughs> no, brother, if I get on live and I'm teaching and I'm propagating a point and someone wants to challenge me on that, they have every right to ask me to debate that. You understand? Right. All I can do is present my evidence and uh you know and see and see how it's perceived by the judges. The reason we debate is because we 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 open ourselves up for peer review. 
That's what debate is. We open ourselves up for peer review. We, we, we hear from others and we hear from opposing sides. This is what they do in the world of, of, of scholarship, man. Everything's a debate. You have two sides to everything. Now it's uh, up to us to do our own research and determine the best who presented the most information to substantiate their, their case, right? Right, right. Yeah, man. Um, and, and that's just going to bring the best out of us. You know, people are afraid of that. Afraid of, you know, back when I was a part of this organization, I ain't going to say their name. They used right. to, oh, you brothers got the spirit of variance. They used to go to that scripture in Galatians, or uh, one of the Paul writings, right? It, no, bro, that's not the spirit of variance. That that spirit you need to, to uh, ha have that to spare growth. You know what I'm saying? You want a bunch of robots that, that don't grow, don't learn, don't... Babe, would you bring my Bible, please? You know what I'm saying? Um, that don't dare to be different. You know what I'm saying? And then, okay, the truth ain't going to go nowhere. And you're going to get washed by the people that is doing that. Our enemies is doing that. Our enemies... Yeah, man. Let me, let me, go, ahead. Let me go ahead and cut, cut the hell out of that real quick, that spirit of variance. That, that, that is ridiculous and absurd. If you don't know, this is what Paul did. He traveled and he confronted uh, the scholastic world. You understand? This is, uh, let me get, I'm going to get this first real quick. Uh, first Corinthians chapter one. What does the Bible say? I think I'm going to start at the 21st verse. Let me see real quick. Right. Uh, first Corinthians chapter one. Verse 20, verse 20, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. What does the Bible say? Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? You understand? So this is a call out, man. This is a call out. You understand? And things that are being labeled as foolish is where the Bible said the most high is going to hide truth. What does it say here? Have God not made the made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So it's all about um, confronting the world's ideology, you know, in regards to information. So it's nothing wrong with debate. It's nothing wrong with debate. It actually makes us better. You understand it, it actually requires growth. And if you come in and you lose, hopefully you will gain something from that loss and be able to go back and substantiate your point further. But brothers don't have the courage nor the testicular fortitude to take a loss. Yeah. Yeah, that's why that's why Nazareth, Judah Nazareth, don't want to uh take that chance because he know he know he on he on he on shaky ground with that topic, mm -hmm. man. Mm -hmm. he very shaky ground. <laughs> 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 Look, man, just say that, bro. Be honest, man. You know, but then, you know, forget him, man. Look, I'm glad everybody came out, came through, and uh, hope y'all learned something and gleaned something from the bond to expansion. My whole point of the presentation um, was to, you know, inform brothers and sisters on what was really going on with the Bonto expansion and the evidence that points to a Western uh, Asian origin of the Bonto, Ooh, right? Versus the postulated African origin. I think it's more evident. Like, like I said earlier, if, if Jeremiah approached you with all Chinese garb on. Chinese clothes, brother understood Chinese. He he had he knew kung fu. You know what I'm saying? Why would you then think that this brother is from anywhere else but China? So right, that's, that's would, the origin of those 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 things, those clothing and their behavior. Exactly. Same thing with the Bantus. Everything about them is Western Asian. You know what I'm saying? And you're gonna automatically assume they, Africa, that don't make no sense. 
<laughs> at all. So hopefully that's what 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 uh, the family got from this this uh, presentation. And if I need to do a follow up, I will. You know what I'm saying? But uh, you know, powerful scriptures, by the way, Jeremiah. Uh, those are on point. Uh, I think we should start saying that that Corinthians verse when we do call people out. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. In the live, we should just read that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> right. Be like, hey, hold on, hold on, let's read First Corinthians. I'll have like a little audio snippet. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I think it'd be dope. So yeah, man. Um, uh, but you know, appreciate uh you coming through and making this happen as well. You know what I'm saying? But brother, I gotta, I gotta. I got to shut down, man. I ain't going to lie. It's been a long, long day. Oh, man. I, I appreciate you uh, coming on and, and doing this, man. You said you was going to do it. You was a man of your word. We need more men to be like that, to be a man of their word, man. Despite what, what what's going on, they're able to pull something off in the midst of uh, uh, a troubled day, in the midst of uh, you know whatever it is that you're going through, man. You're holding to your obligations. Uh, these things is what is called character. And it builds character. So I appreciate you, brother. And uh, again, I'm going to go back right now and rewatch this video. All praise and glory. All right, brother Shalom. I also want to say Shalom to the family that came, came through and uh, watched the presentation, man. Yeah, do the same thing. I want you brothers to you know, actually rewatch and you know take notes and actually you know absorb the information as well and share this video. Uh, hit that like button and subscribe to the Source Debate League on youtube also wednesday wednesday the is it the 13th year yeah so wednesday the 13th we got a debate we got james cassell versus deron tillis and they are going to be debating does the messiah come from each song right <laughs> <laughs> so, so that it should be very very Interesting, eye-opening, I guess. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Um, so that's gonna go down Wednesday around eight o'clock, I believe eight o'clock Central Standard Time, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna have Saturday. We got a debate. Uh, we got tanks on the ground, General Yashar versus versus uh Santonio, and they're gonna be debating does the New Testament uh uh <clears throat> say the law is done away with. And that's right. going to be Saturday, I think, at 7. And then Sunday, we got a double header. Uh, if, if Gideon Step, if you own, man, uh, you got to hit me up on Facebook so we can solidify everything for promotion. But right. We got, we got um, Yawasop versus Gideon Stepper, and they, they're going to be debating uh, something to do with the Gentiles, man. The Gentiles are what now? What are they debating? Uh, uh, the debate is going to be, um, does the reward, that's, they're using the word lot, but it, it equates to reward. Does the lot of the Gentiles, will there be certain Gentiles that receive a greater lot than the children of Israel that make it into the kingdom? So it, it's, it's, it's basically the argument is about will the children of Israel be superior in the kingdom over the Gentiles. Okay, okay. So, yeah, powerful information should come out, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then I'm going to debate the brother and, and beat the living break. Like, you know, the, the living <laughs> <laughs> hey, this brother in for it, man. This brother is pr pretty much saying that all Israel got to be Negro, and I'm going to kill that notion. You know what I'm saying? That's that's some crazy talk. So I'll beat him up and anybody that, that feel that same way. Uh yeah, come come see the bully, man. We gotta talk. Yeah, man. I got a um uh, I was on a video last night, man. I did, man. I did like 14 hours yesterday, man. After I got off, after we got off the live, doing an eight hour live, our longest video to date. Yeah. Eight hours. Um, after we got off there, I jumped on with some brothers and they're there's a brother that came on that want, wants to join the league and he wants to debate uh, the daytime morning to morning Shabbat. Morning to morning Shabbat. 
That means when the sun rises on Saturday until the sun rises on Sunday is the actual Shabbat. I don't see that nowhere in antiquity. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you understand? I don't see that nowhere. But uh, for those brothers that's in the source that is watching, hit me up, man. I got somebody that want to debate that. I got another brother that reached out to me earlier that said he want to take that on. So look, man, we working over here at the source, man. Oh, we got another. Okay, so sure, man. We it's gonna be a loaded month, man. You got this <laughs> every weekend is gonna be a debate this month, so y'all in for a treat, right? You no, know, so I'm, I'm gonna end up being twenty two and oh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Hey, hey, you know, so let me say this before we get out of here too. Uh, yeah, you know, the difference between us and them, <clears throat> and by them, his name rhymes with Neg Ellipse. You know what I'm saying? We right. actually got works to substantiate what we talk about, man. You are the cats, man. Y'all just full of hot, hot air. Until we see y'all putting that work, you ain't gonna get no respect at the source. And that's just point blank, man. We're gonna judge you by your works, bro. Just like the creator, man. Right. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, man. Uh yeah, man, because uh, cause that 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 particular brother. <laughs> actually gave me a date a, a date so i want to talk to you about that man you know i'm gonna let you get some rest tomorrow so we'll try to talk about that tomorrow if we can pull that off we we what this will be what our fourth our fourth attempt right <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you snake me? ellipse you know what i'm saying i ain't gonna say his name because is he not worthy of it <laughs> <laughs> But y'all gonna see who it is if he show face, and I'm gonna beat his face in. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna beat that man up so bad he's gonna be unrecognizable to his own mama. You hear me? Damn, <laughs> Damn man. I mean, look, and this brother got this brother talked that big talk too, boy. You know what I'm saying? And, and the thing is, the brothers, brothers intelligent, but a lot of intelligent brothers come on the source and get the smack la smack laid down on their candy ass. You understand? So. <laughs> That don't mean a damn thing, okay? What is your what, what what is your presentation and what is your information on a particular topic that you're dealing with, man? Yeah, yeah, especially if your, your PowerPoint is construction paper and glitter. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Man, brother, stop being so damn cheap. You know what I'm saying? Get you a little laptop for $150, $200. You know what I'm saying? Laptops don't even run that. You know what I'm saying? Get you get your laptop so you can get your little presentation game going. Feel me? Yeah. I mean, somebody, somebody said something to you, man. Uh, I want you to see it real quick. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, yeah, man. We I might do another show on Garfield because I didn't get to finish the uh the clips uh, uh, of that brother. Shout out to that brother, man. Anonymous Hebrew and Yahoo Kanan. They went in on that brother. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, rest in peace, Garfield. My condolences. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I mean, yeah, look. read that next one. Read that next one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got that Garfield pack in the L. We smoking Garfield over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hey, man. But um, yeah, man. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and. Go ahead and lay it down. Get ready for another day at the at the work. So at the job. So. Oh yeah, that's that. Uh, that's that's that Gucci man. Uh, uh, uh a young Jeezy uh, quote right there, huh? Yeah, yeah, but he got it from Chicago. You know, you know them dudes is vicious up there, man. They tear tear each other head apart, literally. You right. Know, they high as hell up there. So they coach, <laughs> they coach when they when they kill somebody from an enemy hood they say they smoke it like when they roll up their weed well they, they name weed after that they did they did ops wow. they up there. but yeah yeah they, they super violent uh but yeah but anyway we smoking on garfield man <laughs> hey we smoking oh, on um on uh sarah Sue city from when he got smoked by uh what's that brother name back in the day you know what I'm saying? This was before coming on trial. Yeah, man, I don't know where, where that brother been, man. That brother used to be all over YouTube, man. I ain't seen and heard from that brother. I ain't. I, I guess I ain't tapped in as, as I used to be, I guess. 
man, he went to Georgia, tried to run for a, a political office, and I don't know. I guess he's keeping his head low. I guess he don't like the the drama of the internet because a lot of drama with it too. Bro. Facts. You know what I mean? Hey, what what what? Uh, J Electronica said, "Ain't no glory in this, just contempt." And he ain't lying. It, it, once you, if you're doing anything successful, it, it, you you uh work hard at it, or you know, say I have any success, contempt gonna come with that thing, man. So. Right. You know how I go, but man, let's get out of here, man. As you see in the building, y'all stay on the lookout. Wednesday, Saturday, we got debates. Sunday, we got debates. Y'all come through. Hey, man, shout out to the Gold Coast Gorillas, man. You know what I'm saying? That's what we are, right? We the ones that cultivated that Western Africa, man, and and, and, right. and got it to where you know what I mean, where where it, it became famous. You understand? Right. We the Israelites, man. Understand that, man. Facts, man. We we ran Africa. Let's get it. <laughs> in the building.